Hello, everyone. My name is Kaviri Robinson. And I'm Arzu Osanlu. Thank you for joining us. We are coming to you from the University of Washington Simpson Center for the Humanities. We welcome you to our Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the Global North. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. So we seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of study of humanitarianism and emphasize instead experiences in regions across the global south. Throughout this year, we have been comparing the conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices and illuminate how values beyond those of the Western Enlightenment, capitalism and neoliberalism, constitute suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualifies as worthy of that care. Today's event is the third of three webinars in our final theme, Rethinking the Human. In this part of the seminar, we continue the work of decentering the West from ownership of humanitarianism. And we do this by exploring how our, how our examination of humanitarianism's multiple genealogies requires us to encompass, to encompass different modalities of life and to embrace its varied rationalities with diverse forms of care. Through this inquiry, we seek to consider not only the suffering of and care for distant others, but also for the dead, non-human species, and the environment, subjects and entities who are often pres presumed to be beyond the limits of care. We are delighted to welcome professors Nermi Mufta and Juno Salazar Perenyes to present their talks exploring empathy beyond human relations and how human-animal relations are forged and tested in the service of humanitarian work. In each talk, these scholars explore our theme, our quarterly theme, Rethinking the Human, by attending to what a common humanity might be if we take into consideration our relations with non-humans and the environment. Our colleague, Borju Ege, one of our pre-dissertation fellows for this Sawyer seminar, will be today's moderator. And now we turn to her to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Arzu. I would like to welcome our speakers today, Professors Narmin Mufta and Juno Salazara Perenas. Narmin Mufta is Assistant Professor of Religion at Butler University. Her ethnographic research examines the political and religious implications of Muslim social welfare practices. Juno Salazar Perenas is Assistant Professor of Science and Technology Studies and Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies at Cornell University. Juno is also the author of Decolonizing Extinction, published by Duke University Press in 2018. We are also joined today by our esteemed colleague, Jenna Grant, taking the role of discussant for this webinar. Jenna is a cultural anthropologist working in the fields of medical anthropology, feminist and postcolonial science and technology studies, visual anthropology, and Southeast Asia studies. And now I would like to welcome Narmin, Juno, and Jenna, and let them say a few words before we start the pre-recorded talks. Thank you. I'm just so delighted to be here. Um, I've really been learning so much um, from this series over the years, so it's just a delight. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for bringing us all together for this. Yeah, I just want to echo the gratitude in hosting this conversation, and I look forward to the question and answer session. Yeah, thanks to the organizers and Caitlin as well, um, and the Simpson Center, and Arzu and Kabiri, Nadiha, Bursu. Um, I'm looking forward to the talk.
It's a pleasure to share my work in a series that I've learned so much from over the last several months. Thank you to the Sawyer Seminar organizers for creating the forum for these conversations. My research examines Muslim projects variously articulated as social welfare, development, humanitarianism, and care. I explore this theme across two major projects. One centered on activism for literacy and the other on the care of abandoned children. Today's talk goes in a different direction by looking not at humanitarian actions themselves, but at the use of non-human animals to fundraise for one of Pakistan's largest humanitarian organizations, Al Khidmat Foundation. Today's talk is part of a paper that contributes to a collaborative project, Rethinking Humanitarianism in Muslim Contexts. I begin by introducing you to an annual fundraising ritual associated with animal sacrifice. I then briefly ethnographically depict the fundraising practice. In the third section, I examine a Muslim reformist view of animal slaughter to understand the kinds of human, non-human animal relations that, for al khidmat distinguish the human. I conclude by reflecting on how the organization articulates their understanding of sacrifice for God to serve humanity. My presentation depicts an Islamist organization's articulation of humanitarianism through the human capability of sacrifice. On Eid day in Lahore, following the early morning prayer, the slaughter began. Butchers sharpened their knives and said, in the name of God, God is great. Then quickly ran their blade along the animal's throat. The slaughter took place in front of apartment blocks, inside schoolyards, and in city squares. In Pakistan, one of the most significant celebrations on the Muslim calendar, Eid al-Azha, or Feast of the Sacrifice, is marked by two major rituals. At the center of the feast is the annual slaughter commemorating the prophet Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son. In Pakistan, this ritual slaughter is called Qurbani. Many people purchase their sacrificial animal or portion of an animal from charitable organizations who distribute the meat. The second ritual dating to the country's earliest days as a nation is the collection of animal hides from the sacrifice. NGOs, political parties, and madrasas annually compete to collect and auction the sacrificial skins. My talk today takes animal hides as a key object of a humanitarian fundraising practice. Each year, hundreds of organizations monetize the remains of the sacrifice through hide collection by auctioning animal hides to tanneries. Al Khidmat claims to be the originator of the practice. The organization is the social welfare branch of one of the world's most recognizable Islamist parties, the Jamaat-e Islami, founded by the major modernist reformist thinker Sayyid Abulala Maududi. Al Khidmat leadership credit him as the person who devised sacrificial skins as profitable for charitable works. In 1990, Al-Khidmat legally established itself as independent of the political party. It's now one of the most prominent humanitarian organizations in Pakistan's vast NGO landscape. Like many other Pakistani NGOs, Al-Khidmat blurs the boundaries between humanitarianism, development, and social welfare. These organizations provide the essential social services that create and connect life in the country. Their works are primarily focused in Pakistan, but extend to emergency relief projects in other Muslim majority countries. Their services range from orphan care and education to disaster relief and interest-free loans, among other activities, all of which they describe as service to humanity. Historically, the animal hide collection has generated the second highest source of Al-Khidmat's annual income, 
exceeded only by obligatory uh, alms or zakat. However, hype collection once profitable has been waning in Pakistan for about a decade. The income has come under threat by the rise of synthetic leathers on the global market and inflation. Heat and monsoon rains have recently devastated the skins, driving down prices by more than half. Added to these risks, stiff competition between organizations for the skins can lead to violent incidents of hide snatching. All of these factors have left the country's leather commodity in peril, and with it, the fate of a major source of income for the country's social services. The dwindling funds raised from the Hyde's collection over the last 10 years has given rise to a novel form of sacrifice associated with the practice. Sacrificial skins remain a powerful object of social mobilization, even when their value as a market commodity is in question. A tradition devised around ritual animal sacrifice has come to instantiate sacrifice writ large of personal time and safety, of the organization's resources, and sometimes of intimate relations. Sacrifice is the motivating value that underpins dedication to the annual hide collection. Ahmed, a 28-year-old al Khidmat foreign relations officer, described how they fine-tuned the collection method over the years. He explained, we transform the process into a combined activity. Korbani and skins collection. We now perform it in a mechanized way. While much of the slaughter was literally mechanized with bone saws and flaying machines doing much of the work, Ahmed referred to more than the machinery. He described a technical and bureaucratic process that deployed 2,500 volunteers in an elaborate organizational ritual. Al Khidmat's Lahore branch ran their mass slaughter just outside of the city in Raiwind. There, hundreds of cows and goats were mechanically processed for thousands of donors, mostly from Pakistan, but also the United Kingdom and across the world. As the animal pens emptied out, a drone overhead captured the day in a live stream on Al Khidmat's website. The whir of saws was audible from where the last of the cows milled about. By late afternoon, as the last of the animals were processed, the refrigerated truck was stacked with freshly packed meat and a lorry piled with animal hides and skins. I joined an Al Khidmat employee to follow the skins to a warehouse in Lahore. Traffic thickened as we entered Lahore's leather market district. Scooters, motorbikes, and open back trucks carried fluffy sheepskins and flat brown cow hides from the morning sacrifice. Dozens of other organizations competed annually with each other to fetch people's sacrificial skins, and the leather market was where they converged to preserve them. Workers immediately began unloading a truck that arrived just behind us. The men sorted the hides, separating different animal skins, so cows, sheep, goats, and camels, and different levels of quality, A, B, C, and D. A slender paid laborer hammered away on hardened bags of salt that solidified in the humidity, shaking sweat from his skin with each contact. The salt was essential to coat and stack the skins in their preservation process. As trucks dropped off the skins, they handed off tabulations to an al Khidmat volunteer who took the paper to a makeshift office the bureaucratic engine of the collection. Three days later, tanneries would come and bid on the skins in an open auction. This is when Ahmed would learn how much or whether they made money from the collection that year. In what remains of my talk, I situate hide collection within the organization's view of animals and sacrifice. While the humanitarian drive to end suffering focuses on the human, its purview of addressing the most vulnerable has come to include animals. 
Miriam Tickton argues that humanitarianism works by expanding the figure of the innocent, where animals are taken as archetypal innocent victims. al khidmat's use of the animal through sacrifice and the use of their skins then offers an alternative view, not one that is expansive to include non-human animals, but one that focuses on the human as unique among God's creations. In their view, the human is uniquely responsible for judgment, distinctively capable of intellectual thought, and perhaps most importantly in the context of al khidmat's Eid al-Azha, spiritually capable of sacrifice. During Eid in Lahore, livestock were tended to and cared for. Their role in the ritual made them vulnerable, and for many, figures to feel close to and even mourn after their slaughter. During the lead up to Eid, livestock shared the city streets with humans and were sometimes brought into homes and briefly integrated into families. In Karachi and Lahore, where I did my field work, families took their cattle for a stroll in whatever green space they could find or just on the streets. Owners adorned their animals with decorative tassels and bells. On the third day of Eid, during a long commute to a collection point, an Uber driver recounted his festivities with me. While his family was celebrating Eid, he admitted they shared a lingering sadness. He missed the goat who had become a part of his family, even if for a short time. The driver's comments suggest sacrifice not only of the animal to God, but of the severing of a relation formed with the family. The driver's sense of loss underlined how, through the ritual slaughter, he staged his devotion to God so that in killing the goat, he felt a loss. The ritual slaughter must first be marked by care of the animal, their adornment, rearing, and in some cases, forming a bond and then from care to a willingness to slaughter. At the same time, animals are broadly seen as figures of desperation and indignity. Ahmed explained the need to respect the dignity of those al khidmat does their work with, explaining, people here are made to live like animals. His expression, one echoed by interlocutors in Pakistan, as well as in my primary research sites in Egypt and Morocco, captures a critique of national governments that neglect and abuse their people, as well as an international community that does not value Muslim life. In this view, prioritizing the care of animals over non-humans is precisely what is inhumane. al khidmat mobilizes a cosmological hierarchy to articulate the uniqueness of humanity. For them, while humans are at the top of a hierarchy of God's creations, they are also notably weak, subject to God's mercy, Brahma, and a knowing of God's decree, Qadar. Wakas, one of the organization's founding members, articulated to me that the human is one who thinks, who organizes, and who at their best surrenders to God. Only the human, what cost reminded me, is capable of sacrifice. And it's through the collection that al khidmat further invests in sacrifice. For what cost, the merits of animal sacrifice come with the distribution of meat to the poor. The Eid slaughter fulfills a ritual. However, its meaning lies in its potential to fulfill a social obligation. He lamented waste of any kind, meat or skins pointing out that waste nullifies the act of sacrifice. Wakas stressed the need to use all resources efficiently, from the living, like animals and trees, to the not living, like water. As he explained, the animal sacrifice is to God, but it's through the distribution of meat and the use of the animal skins that the sacrifice serves humanity. For Wakas, a personal willingness to sacrifice is lacking today among Muslims and is a quality essential to one's character. In his view, extending the sacrifice through the Hides collection cultivates character and heightens humanity. For al khidmat humanity is not developed in a breakdown in the human-non-human-animal hierarchy, 
but rather in how they productively turn the animal into a product for social welfare, one that both feeds and fundraises. Notably, al khidmat does not denominate their humanitarianism as Islamic. They take humanitarianism to be the bedrock of calling to and serving humanity. Nor do they situate their humanitarianism in opposition to a transnational humanitarianism of liberal Euro-American Euro provenance. The Islamist organization's articulation of humanitarianism is forged through their notion of the human and the human capability of sacrifice. al khidmat sharpens what it means to be human through the way animals are used in an industrious modern sacrifice, an annual fundraiser to support their programs throughout the year. In the face of disease, flood, violence, and emerging economic realities, to sell skins for social services is a ritual born of tradition and modernized through an organization's refinement of their collection ritual. Al-Khidmat continues to adapt an idea born of a practice founded on economic calculation that today is instead enlivened in spite of it. Hi, my name is Juno Salazar Paranias. I'm sheltering in place on the traditional homelands of the Gaya Kohono. The Gaya Kohono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University where I work, New York State, and the United States of America, all of which, including Cornell's land base and endowment, were built through genocide on stolen land. Universities have been and often continue to be structured by racism, sexism, classism, and heterosexism. And yet they also serve as refuges, as places that offer and foster other ways of thinking and being. And it's in that space of alterity that goes against the foundations of the institution that I'm virtually visiting you at the University of Washington with a lot of gratitude. The organizers have asked me to reflect on a few questions, all of which I find provocative. In the 15 minutes that I have with you all, I'd like to address just two. What does it mean for our common humanity if we take into consideration the multiple ways that humans interact with their environments? And how do these interactions shape the discipline of care for others? This question of common humanity and care for others comes to me while I continue to be disturbed by two ongoing and interlinked crises. Both crises anchor the moral weight of our time. One crisis is outright species as extinction and what is euphemistically called the loss of biodiversity. The other crisis is the fortressing of nation state borders in the United States, North America, Europe, North Africa, and Asia that deny the nature of people who like birds and many other animals move and migrate around the world. We find ourselves in an era of desensitization when people on social media have an easier time circulating and consuming multi-species stories of captive cheetahs and their canine companions, and when they cannot stomach the multi-species story of people held captive, denied basic hygiene, and thus suffering from scabies and treatable infections and ailments like the flu and dehydration that turn deadly in the face of neglect and abuse. Practices and policies of dehumanization, animality, and the way racism manifests in dehumanized animality have a long history. The history of science has many examples from which to choose. We can go to early 19th century race science as expressed through Samuel Morton's measurements of skulls stolen from casualties of the Seminole Wars. Stephen Jay Gould, the paleontologist and historian 
has famously described how Morden's mismeasured skulls were used to argue for a scientific basis of white supremacy. More recent examples include Nazi ideology that linked Polish Jews and typhoid carrying lice, which culminated in millions of people dying by way of cyanide. Cyanide was initially developed as a pesticide, as Hugh Raffles has discussed. Likewise, Clapperton Mafunga shows how white soldiers in the 1970s who were defending the settler colony Rhodesia would poison revolutionaries fighting for a liberated Zimbabwe with agricultural pesticides contaminating their water supplies. Unlike these other examples of ongoing racism that are expressed through dehumanization and animalization, I think there's something new in this era. What is unique to our time now is that animals are represented as having distinct personalities and that these personalities are apolitical and entertaining. We are now in a moment in which racialized people are apprehended, incarcerated, treated inhumanely en masse, held captive and denied attention, while some animals achieve individuality, personal care, and attention. This moment is not specific to what some would call the Trump era. Such a term for a zeitgeist mistakenly aggrandizes one individual over larger cultural forces. It's too easy to blame one person, and it keeps up the myth of American exceptionalism by ignoring the rise of authoritarian regimes around the world. Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India, and Putin in Russia all think of themselves as strong men able to vanquish enemies with impunity, and for whom humanity in humanitarianism has little meaning. So if this era is not the Trump era, I'm not totally wedded to this term, but I think it's post-humanism. This moment is duly characterized by captive interspecies friendships and people in cages. It is the result of three historical moments. I list these moments in the order at which I came to know them and the order in which they have transformed my thinking. The first is the open demise of human rights since the war on terror. There is a distinct openness about the utter disregard of human rights violations. And this image is a painting by the artist Fernando Botero based on the very notorious photographs taken by US soldiers torturing Iraqi civilians at the Abu Ghraib prison. This is paired with the cynical rhetoric of preventative war as a means to promote human rights and particularly women's rights as Laila Lakot has written. Secondly, from the 1970s onward, genetic analysis caused a paradigm shift for biology. The previous five kingdoms of biology, including the animal kingdom, have since been replaced with the three domain system single cellular life, which is represented in the purple on this diagram, arcane um, and long extinct life, which is in green, and multicellular life, which is in the pink and mauve. In the paradigm of contemporary microbiology, humans here in the pink are not exceptional animals. Instead, we are merely examples of multicellular organisms. As many already know, the genetic material of our human bodies is at least 90% bacterial. Boundaries between human bodies and environments are very blurry when you think about microbiomes and how we inhabit spaces in which we are always outnumbered by microorganisms. And thirdly, this is the more complicated one. The idea of human stems from a European sense of personhood. We can call the sense of human an autological subject using Beth Povinelli's term, or man one using Sylvia Winter's term. 
following winter, the concept of man came to justify the killing and abuse of those who are not man. And that includes African people, people indigenous to the Caribbean and the Americas, and the ecologies in which these people lived. Privileging the human above everything else means that the environment falls into the mere background instead of being constitutive of a core state of being. The two crises that worry me, species extinction and the logic of fortress nation states that deny asylum seekers and other migrant safety makes me question the project of a common humanity. Take for instance, this example. In 2019, four activists with the organization No More Deaths were found guilty of trespassing Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge, where they left water for migrants in the harsh Sonora Desert. Their sentence included 15 months of probation in which they were no longer allowed to re-enter the wildlife refuge. As the anthropologist Jason de Leon shows, the Sonora Desert has been weaponized as a deterrent against migrants in the past decade. Pig bodies and human bodies literally disintegrate from the arid heat. As a longtime No More Deaths volunteer named Catherine Gaffney said, quote, if giving water to someone dying of thirst is illegal, what humanity is left in the law of this country, end quote. Common humanity can be used as a weapon to destroy life-giving ecologies for the sake of a hydropower dam or an agricultural industrial water source. In the case of Malaysian dams and California water sourcing, ecocide is justified if it benefits many. Yet in practice, such projects often only really benefit those who are able to accrue wealth from them. And the long-term effects are much greater than what is usually assessed in the short term. I'm not the only one to think pessimistically about humanism, humanitarianism, and what kinds of violence happens under the name of a common humanity. For instance, the historian of science, Juan Sebastian Guerriano at UPenn, has a work in progress about Marie Vivon Veillard. She was lauded as the living example of the 1950 UN Declaration of Human Rights because she was kidnapped as a child and stolen from her, quote, primitive, end quote, circumstances and raised as a French girl. Her rearing was an experiment of liberal anti-racism that proved that all children, when given the same circumstances, can grow up to become laboratory assistants. Yet this was made possible by the abduction of an indigenous girl. And that practice of abduction has a very old history from at least the 1700s when Jesuits in South America would kidnap indigenous children and institutionalize them to save their souls. And another example of skepticism concerning a common humanity, Nathan Snaza and Julieta Singh in the most recent issue of Social Text take up Sylvia Winter's ideas to conclude that universities are, quote, an induction into being man, coupled with violent forms of dehumanization that exclude or devalue anyone who can't or won't be thus mastered, end quote. In its stead, they suggest a dehumanist education divorced from the state. So to tell you the truth, I'm not so ready to join the dehumanist life raft floating away freely from the university. In the space of learning that I value, in the institutions of higher education that I love, no one ever becomes a master of knowledge, but instead commits to becoming a lifelong student. This orientation to learning is what I think is the best part of the humanities. So let me return to the questions 
now that you all know that I am skeptical of the project of a common humanity, while I'm still committed to humanism and humanistic inquiry. What does it mean for our common humanity if we take into consideration the multitude of ways that humans interact with our environments and how do these interactions shape their discipline of care for others? A common humanity that ignores the significance of ecologies and environments for human and all kinds of life threatens to be a form of colonization. I'm thinking of how bacteria colonize when I say by colonization. In bacterial colonization, some bacterial conspecifics give up their own lives so that others in their colony can flourish. This is what you're seeing in this giant Petri dish. Colonization in this bacterial sense works like colonization in a broader sense. It reinforces a hierarchy in which one's own kind is more important than others. So this begs the question that is slightly different from the question posed to me. What would a common humanity be if it recognized the significance of ecologies and included the way humans are entangled with and perhaps even constituted by their environments? My answer is simple. A common humanity would take seriously the friendships that conform with radical differences across species while also being able to take seriously the plight of caged in people. A common humanity would recognize that people want to freely move like birds, butterflies, mountain lions, coyotes, and bobcats. Ultimately, a common humanity that embraces the environment would reject the opposition between caring about wildlife and caring about people because it ought to be important to humanely care about both. Hi. Welcome. Thank you both so much for <clears throat> those talks and for sharing your ideas with us. So my name again is Jenna. I'm in the anthropology department at the University of Washington and at Southeast Asia Studies. Um, and I'm going to uh, have a lead a 15 to 20 minute discussion with our speakers and then we're going to open up um, for a Q&A from everyone who's in the audience. So I would like to start with the discussion of the concept of common humanity. It seems like there's a productive friction in your papers. Juno, your skepticism of common humanity or the work done in its name. Nermeen, your interlocutor's commitment to it, their definitions of humanity's distinctness and their work done in its service. Could you reflect on this friction, perhaps putting your projects or your papers into conversation with each other? Thank you so much, Jenna, um, for that question. Um, maybe I'll start us off, but Juno, let's let's just go back and forth. Um, yeah, I I think our papers are working on different planes in terms of articulating this idea of common humanity. Um, so you know, my paper is trying to make an argument that I'm seeing on the ground, and so Jenna, I think you you know you capture it perfectly, right? That um, that al Khidmet is working for this, this idea of a common humanity. I think one, one other big difference between the way Juno and I are thinking about common humanity is that for al Khidmet, humanity, I think, means something different than it does for Juno, right? It's, it's explicitly um, for humans, right? And non-human animals are not a part of that humanity, right? Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that while there is this consideration of, you know, how to use resources, how and, and animals are considered resources in this view, um, including water, including plants, um, those are specifically not humanity, and that's sort of tied to their idea of, of the soul and, and the human and in their sort of Muslim worldview. So that just gets us started a bit. You know, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your paper and. I was thinking a lot about sacrifice, um, you know, uh, in relation also to uh, a person who's probably not here, Radhika Govindrajan, but who is otherwise normally at uh, UW. Um, but in this section of the paper that I talk about bacteria giving up their own lives, um, 
the actual term that's being used is sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that, that's actually becoming then a, a term that scientists are using to describe uh, what is the giving up of uh, one's own life for their conspecifics for the other bacteria just like them. <laughs> um, and so it's not a metaphor insofar that it's describing a very material activity and uh, a, a sense of self in a broad, almost, um, it's not a holistic, but it's in a very broad sense of selfhood that a self can sacrifice oneself. It's almost like a, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, the person who I keep thinking about is actually Eduardo Cohn and the like, how forests think in the forest as a self and that there's a lot of different kinds of selves. And in thinking about bacteria, bacteria do sacrifice themselves. And so I wonder what your interlocutors would think about that. Is it that um, they do not think of a bacterial um, specimen sacrificing itself and therefore it's not uh it's not a human <laughs> you know or is it that a uh, sacrifice can um uh doesn't require that kind of level of consciousness that's asked the, the thing that i think is really fascinating too is um how the um selfhood is so much attached to the supernatural in, in the sense of it's it's a willful sacrifice that that is a, about a moral constitution but then it's um uh that it's it's not just a sacrifice uh or, or not just a cognition to me it seems like there's there's an a supernatural to it like a more than human to it that i'm wondering if you could unpack because it's not just like religion as a set of morals or ethics, but uh, Islam is, is something bigger uh, with jinns and spirits and, and everything, you know, that's, that's more than human always. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot there. Let me just maybe nibble on the last part in terms of thinking about other ideas of the non-human in their worldview. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, so it absolutely does. I, I think in terms of how it relates to the practice of the ritual sacrifice, I think it's sort of, it's sort of less present in, in specifically what it was that I was looking at. Um, although it's, it's certainly central to the way they conceive of the world. Um, I think that the question about who can sacrifice and what that makes the, the entity is really interesting and it's and it's almost like what is raised as in the sphere of human distinctiveness among your interlocutors so it's it's thanks for bringing up that moment in your talk you know about the bacteria doing it too it's certainly a, a discourse also about animals you know doing this as well so the different types of mutuality I guess right mm -hmm. or thinking of, of for what um, so I had a very different kind of question, which was about um, images and visual technologies, because I was intrigued um, that you both have, you both address making and circulating images in your talk, and you do it in different ways. Um, Nermeen, you describe drone footage, live stream to a website, and also um, this, I, this idea that the devotion to God is staged in particular ways, there's an audience. Um, and Juno, you suggest social media of captive interspecies friendships might train us to care for animals and uh, to not care for humans in particular ways. So I'd love to hear you talk more about the visuality of learning to care or to neglect others? Um, how are you thinking about either spectacle or media or visuality? Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Juno. Okay, yeah, thanks. So yeah, you know, the power of the image of a little baby um, cheetah <laughs> with a uh, Labrador retriever puppy is extremely powerful because of its visual language. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's, it's the visual that works as a synesthesia, you know, of the, the sight with the, with the fur, the fluffy fur. And it's something about youthfulness of a, a baby cheetah and a baby dog that um, is so um, compelling to people. And uh, so, yeah, I do 
think it's pornographic in the sense that there's so much desire attached to it and it's a corporeal desire. Um, but yeah, so that kind of uh, visual seduction of, of cute little baby animals is an utter contrast from the, the visual sight that a lot of artists have played with you know, like, uh, I can't remember the name of the artist, but it's somewhere here in Manhattan where they had like a, a cage and a crumpled up um, pile of children's clothing and then a, a, an audio of like a child crying, right? Of, of showing how desensitized people are to uh, human violence, to violence against humans and violence against children. And especially like children who are then racialized through the process of being detained and incarcerated. So um, it's, uh, yeah, like the, the visual, but also the, the variety of different uh, sensations are evoked by it. And it's not like, the visual is the most powerful, I would say for social media, because it's the, it's the clickbait, <laughs> you know? Um, but it, it does evoke a range of, of feeling and sensation. But yeah, it is so much about capturing uh, audience attention to things that people want to be captured by as opposed to those to things that they don't want to be arrested by. Yeah, um, Jenna, I love this question because it gets to something that was sort of troubling me when I was putting together the presentation. Um, so I don't normally take as many photographs as I do when I do field work than I did on this project. Um, and I was really trying to understand why I took so many photographs um, over those days, you know. Um, and I, you know, I think the sacrifice is a spectacle. It's supposed to be a spectacle, right? And that's not just because it, it's not just as me, somebody new to this context. It's for everybody. It is a spectacle, right? Um, and so it's not just me taking photos. It's you know the the people who work for Al Khidmat are taking photos. Um, the posters are there staged for the photographs, right? So I sort of leaned into that and participated in it as I should have, you know, or as, as I think I should have, right? I also think the sacrifice is supposed to be witnessed, right? So it's a spectacle because it's precisely because we're supposed to watch it, right? Mm. And are supposed to have reverence, right, for, um, for witnessing. Yeah. I think my being torn by sharing those images then in a context that I know is different is to risk an audience that understands this ritual then as, you know, bloody, brutal, barbaric, all of that, right? So I feel like I have to be really careful. And so that's why, I, again, I really appreciate having the question um, to think about it because, um, yeah, I just other, you know, because because it can feed back into the, the very problem that I mentioned at the core of the paper, right? Um, that these people are not seen as human, right? That they're that they're barbarians that per, per, participate in this ritual. So, you know, it's not without risks for sure. I think you both in your um, remarks just now also, you know, this is a long standing debate, right, in visual studies and media studies. Are we brought closer through images? Are we brought to care? Is there a production of a caring witness or is are we desensitized and numbed out? And I think um, what we're seeing is that there's there's both always, right? We're seeing <laughs> and in different ways and maybe as as so what part of our work is to kind of track that and document how it's happening because it is constantly changing in terms of the audience and the, um, the particular audience, the human that's being produced through the, as the viewer, right? Are you supposed to care or not care? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, that art project sounds really interesting in that regard. <laughs> it makes me think of Couple in a Cage too. Um, and the oh, yeah critique of anthropology <laughs> through that particular. Um, let's see, do we have time for another? I have one more question. Are you guys okay moving to another topic? Okay. Um, and this was more of a sort of reflexive question about your own work and the way you do research and sort of care both as an object of study and also a style of doing work as a scholar. So um, 
And, and I think it was really um, provocative for me because your talks were so different and the genres were so different, right? Um, so Nermeen, as you, as you say, you were sort of deep in it, presenting details and an ethnography of how al Kidmat sharpens what it means to be human. I love that phrase. Through practices of collecting and auctioning sacrificial skins of goats, cows, sheep, and camel during Eid al Haza. Juno, you present a diagnosis of, and I think I like the word manifesto because that's how it felt to me. <laughs> a manifesto for our post-human moment, taking care to define what you mean by post-human in relation to the crises of species extinction and fortressing of nation state borders. So I, I was wondering if you could reflect briefly on um, your own methods for uh, humanely caring to use Juno's phrase, right? For human, animal, environment, in other words, care and neglect are things that we study and they're mm -hmm. things we do. So I'm interested in feminist political projects that, that foreground this in particular. Yeah, you know, I come out of a, a, a tradition, you know, of thinking with care and, you know, uh, like a la uh, Maria Bella Casa de Puig, but that's also like a la Donna Haraway. And then I also think about, you know, Anna Singh's uh, Arts of Noticing on a Damaged Planet. Um, that part of the skepticism lately, I feel like noticing that there seems to be an implicit critique against Donna and Anna that noticing isn't enough. You know, but the thing is, I, I do think noticing is important, you know, like, and uh, for me, um, drawing on a variety of disciplines is really important to figure out what to notice. So I, you know, pull from the humanities. I'm, I, I feel like I'm a grounded empiricist. So I base a lot of my suppositions on um, ethnographic experience and, um, I, you know, came up with a method in my, uh, for my book that I didn't describe in my book so well. I wish I did, <laughs> you know, I wish I, I wish I didn't delete it, but you know, it was, it was uh, with the first book, um, uh, uh, the peer reviews, I, I uh, capitulated too much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes you don't, sometimes you shouldn't capitulate. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but yeah, so the, um, <laughs> with the method that I had done in my field work, which is that I used the animal behavioral sampling technique of looking at a specific individual, for lack of a better word, and recorded with pen what I observed that individual doing. And so then that got me to think about the kind of interactions that happen without language. Um, and that can lead to misunderstandings and miscommunication or communication. Um, and so observation isn't enough. It has to really be contextualized. And what kinds of context you bring to that really depends on things like, what are you sensitive to? You know, and so then it becomes both an intellectual and political project of what have you spent your life being sensitive towards um, and so, yeah, observation in its pure sense is never enough. And I, I, I can agree with that. But then observation, like, does anybody just ob observe, <laughs> you know, without, without a sense of interpretation and without, you know, that person's own sensitivities? I don't think so. Or, or it reveals sensitivities that are like a little too desensitized. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love, I love you using the word noticing there. Um, I think, I think, if I think about this question in terms of fieldwork, I think it's about listening, you know, as we, as, as we are trained and as we teach, right, is like a kind of presence that allows you to really deeply listen to what it is that you hear. So there I see some real strong connections between what Juno's saying in terms of observation and kind of responsibility um, around observation. I think um, sort of beyond the practice of ethnographic field work, I, I, so before I did field work or before I went to grad school, I worked in international development for a couple of years. And so that, 
haunts me still, <laughs> you know? I mean, I do sometimes still have this wonder of, you know, am I doing the very best thing with the hours that I have on this planet, right? And sometimes, you know, that is a challenging question. Ultimately, I think I conclude something that very, somewhere very close to where Juno does with a real kind of uh, skeptical optimism within the university. So, you know, I do still believe in what it is I'm doing ultimately, but there, it's not without moments of wishing like, you know, rather than a day of grading, I could do something that felt like I was caring in a really physical way, actually, right? Not through my work, but in a really sort of palpable way. I actually really kind of have that yearning sometimes. Thank you both for such thoughtful responses because it's been, it's provocative for me also as someone who's um, <laughs> finishing revisions to hear you talk about how you respond to that. <laughs> um, I am now going to hand over the, the mic um, for the open Q&A. Thank you all for such a insightful conversation. And we have received a lot of interesting questions and I will try to pick common threads and bring them to your attention. So our first question is about gender and it is directed to both of you. So the co question goes like this. How does gender operate in these contexts? For Narmin in human animal relations and in, God's, in relation to God's mercy? For Juno in the notion of taking friendship seriously and rejecting the opposition between human and animal? Yeah, you know, I'm in the camp that thinks gender is everywhere, if you notice it, <laughs> you know, if you pay attention. So um, it's, it's more pronounced in the stories I include in my book. It, these stories that are shared on social media, I um, uh, don't share it so much, um, you know, like the gendered aspects of it, because to tell you the truth, I'm not really sure, because um, that's the limitation of the medium. Uh, however, I can guess who tends to be interested in uh, the cuteness of a cute animal. And I, I do imagine that it is a, a gendered um, a interest at stake, but you know, it's, it is and it isn't in some ways, or, or the way that it's gendered is about affection, you know, and then about extensions of, um, of a humanity. Um, the thing that I find really interesting is that the extension of a humanism towards non-human animals doesn't preclude the limitations and the, and, and the uh, foreclosing of humanity of humans. And I, I feel like I, I witnessed that in social media worlds where um, animal stories are just really pleasurable. Uh, you know, it's the pleasurable escape from, um, uh, from these times. However, yeah, I'm like circling around the gender dynamics. I, I feel like gender is there and it's the examples that I have that do not do justice to the ways that gender uh, shapes relations. Yeah, um, yeah, there's so many things to comment on in terms of gender when it comes to this practice. Um, so, I mean, it's clearly coming from like definitively like a, a patriarchal tradition, right? <laughs> Going back to Abraham, right? So, um, so, so I guess that would be like the sort of broadest point I would make um, about the practice. The, the practice is taken, is carried out by men um, in terms of recipients of the care um, a lot of it is directed particularly towards women. Um, I would also say towards children as well. Um, so part of the field work was tracking the skins, but I was also tracking the meat. So a lot of the meat is directed towards um, women, uh, widows particularly, and orphans. Um, so that's the sort of, I guess, sort of empirical response um, to, to questions of gender. Um, I think you, it, you asked me specifically also about relation to mercy, is that right? I just wanna make sure I have the question. Yes, uh, because like in this context, there is also God and God's mercy when you sacrifice an animal. Yeah, okay, yeah. So um, I, think, I think when it comes to the 
So as I say, I think the practice is certainly extraordinarily gendered. I do think that the articulation of humanity, you know, I, I actually think it is supposed to be specifically ungendered. You, you know, if you look at the etymology of the word and so on, um, it, it doesn't have gender. The way the English carries the word um, man in it, um, the word that they're using in Urdu does not, right? So, and, and I think it's more than just a kind of etymological trick, I think, um, their conception of the human is, is without gender. So I think, you know, sort of mercy is, the idea of God's mercy is, is ungendered. Okay. You know, sorry, I, I just wanna um, sure. think more about that question because um, I'm thinking of the activist group, uh, you know, who got detained and arrested and it was, it, it ended up in two trials, right? Um, the first trial, it was, I think all women, and, and there were like three women who then got arrested and uh, convicted for trespassing. So a probation. There was a man who got tried in a different way, but part of the same organization. And he became well-known, um, like Scott Walker. He's a, he was a PhD actually in geography at Arizona State. And um, I think part of it was that his sentence was very severe. It was going to be a jail sentence if, if he was convicted. Uh, it was some kind of felony um, for which he was charged. Uh, so I'm not sure if, if his fame was related to the fact that the conviction was going to be severe, like, like un unjustly severe, mm -hmm. or how much that narrative became then about being a, a male savior, you know? Mm -hmm. um, a more skeptical person than I am would say that this is like a white male savior complex. Mm -hmm. But part of me really honestly does believe that it was because the uh, potential sentence was so severe. Mm -hmm. And was the severity because he was a man? I think it was literally because of the law and that he was going to be convicted for like trafficking people, something like that. Thank you very much. Um, now, I want to pose you again, both of you, a question. Uh, since both of your talks help us in rethinking human, the human, and I think uh, from both of your talks, we can maybe try to imagine a sort of humanitarianism. Uh, I was wondering how, for example, in the case of Narmin's al Hidme. Uh, whether you can talk about this humanitarianism that is possible within this context a little bit more, how it is different from, I think you use the term transnational humanitarianism. And in the case of Juno, maybe if you think of humanitarianism as a project that is for the good of the humans and the planet and animals, mm -hmm. what would humanitarianism look like? Yeah. I mean, do you want to start? Or? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of what is distinctive, I would say what's distinctive about what's happening with Al Khidmat in Pakistan looks a lot like what's happening in a lot of big aid or development um, Muslim organizations around the world. So some of the, I would just say it's some of the emphases are, are slightly distinct. So a lot of emphasis, for example, on the care of the orphan. Um, and in Pakistan, that looks quite, that's quite, what's distinctive in Pakistan that's interesting there is that the care of the orphan um, is not just about children who are um, relinquished or abandoned, but it's also about, um, it's also for social orphans. So children who have parents, but their life would be in the view of the parents better if they were raised in an institution rather than in the household. Um, so they become almost like boarding schools. That I would say is something pretty distinctive. Um, you know, it happens in other places in the world, but it's something maybe worth mentioning in terms of their ideas, their conceptions about the care of the orphan. Um, some of their, I, some of their ideology around um, sort of Islamic economics um, has them develop particular types of lending, right? So um, things that look a lot like micro enterprise projects um, that they that they offer that use sort of halal lending modes. 
um, those are some some of the specifics. But you know, I think what's interesting about them is precisely that they're not trying to distinguish themselves from other types of humanitarianism. Um, they that's not their game. They're really they're really sort of aligning themselves in many ways with you know large, uh, not even just Muslim, right? Large humanitarian organizations that function around the world. They really see themselves um, in that way. And, and that's what's important rather than distinction. So yeah. about humanitarianism, you know, I, um, I'm, I just attended a talk not long ago, like last week from Ahmad Masharak at the University of Amsterdam because of Zoom, I can't, uh, that is possible. But um, uh, what her new research is on, is about um, making a grave for the uh, people who are lost ashore uh, when they're trying to cross the Mediterranean and uh, um, like making a burial site for them. And, you know, the crisis isn't from like 2016, it's, it's a longer one, you know, and uh, migrants have been dying there since the nineties, but that it's, it's part of the greater consequences of European colonialism, of brain drain in um, you know southern, uh, it's like West Africa, Southern Africa, and um, the modes of extraction, you know, that have utterly transformed these places. And so, my fear, you know, following Masharek, is that humanitarianism is used in a way that just uplifts the, um, the beneficiaries of past and ongoing violence. And it's a way to say that they're in the morally upright, upstanding position from which they do interventions. You know, And I say this, of course, like coming out of this generation marked by the war on terror, right? Of, of seeing for ourselves how humanitarian rhetoric is used to instigate utterly anti-humanitarianism of actually committing war against not even an, a nation, <laughs> you know, uh, but against civilians. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm still thinking about the gender question because I feel like I totally bungled that up. <laughs> you know, like every single person who I'm like influenced by is a feminist theorist. And so then, um, is it that it's like the elephant in the room for me where it's like always there? So it's like, I don't see it, you know, <laughs> but yeah, like certainly, um, yeah, anyways, <laughs> but yeah, sorry, I'm like. Question actually? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so yeah. I would love to follow up on um, where you left off in terms of how the war on terror has shaped your thinking. So I was really yeah. interested in your talk when you were talking about these three historical moments. And I wonder if you can say more about what precisely is distinctive, right, about the war on terror from yeah. other 20th century or totally, right, you know? Totally, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, like, like, um, Lala Khalili has this excellent book. She's, she's like a geographer. Um, but yeah, so she, she actually did look at the work, the WikiLeak dumps, <laughs> and the data dumps and the hundreds of thousands of pages to make this argument about liberal warfare. And uh, she starts it with like um, uh, the Malayan war and the insurgency, uh, um, the crushing of the insurgency from Britain. And so her comparison is Britain, the US and the United States. And in which like to make empire for these liberal nations is to be illiberal uh, in their waging of war. But then, that goes back, of course, to like uh, U.S. imperialism um, and all of the work on the Philippines uh, in the 1890s in the um, Spanish-American War and the Philippine War of Independence that the U.S. crushed uh, and um, co-opted. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think nevertheless, there is this moment where it's about preventative war and, and the way that it seems like it's a, a really different moment of white men's burden of uplifting in the civilizational mode that was common in the 1890s and justified colonialism to um, this moment in which um, 
Yeah, I'm actually not sure what makes it so different because in my head, I'm actually comparing them and, and seeing the common trajectories. Mm -hmm. but, but I do think it's something in the preventative war nature, you know, whereas um, in the 1890s, US involvement against Spain uh, for its commercial interests, for its like capitalist interests uh, was justified as like, we're fighting uh, um, the, uh, like we're protecting the savages, you know, the like childlike savages, you know, from Spanish brutality um, with a, a, a more uplifting form of imperialism um, and white supremacy. So um, I can see the trajectories and yet in my heart of heart, it feels like it's different and I'm not yet sure why it's different. Thank you so much. Uh, now uh, I will pose a couple of individual questions. Uh, one question is for Nermin. So the question is this, uh, she says, I was wondering whether in your field work you ever came across talk references or even storytelling of the parable of the prophet Ibrahim and his willingness to sacrifice. Um, yes, absolutely. It was central. I mean, almost, I, I wouldn't say it, it turned into st outright storytelling, but I would say it was the reference in so many of the conversations um, that I had. But it, it, it was a reference in a way that one, one moved along pretty quickly, but it was the kind of touchstone of how many people spoke about the work they were doing. Okay, thank you. And a very quick question begging for a quick answer from Juno, is this. So it starts with a commentary that says, some of the sources of species extinction come from the movement of species into new ecosystems, Asian carp in the Mississippi River Basin, the cane toad in Australia, the coney rabbit in Africa. Indeed, in B movie horror cinema in the 1970s and 80s, the migration of insects were a trope of fear of immigrant of migrants. Now that we have been talking about all these uh, citizens in the global south, so the question asks, how does the concept of post-humanist life and interspecies entanglement motivate similar dynamics in post-colonial or global south societies? Sorry, uh, what was the last part of the sentence? Because I was I was there with the with the cane toads and the, <laughs> the, the actual the actual question. Yeah. The question goes: How does the concept of posthumanist life and interspecies entanglement motivate similar dynamics in postcolonial or or global South societies? Interesting, interesting. Because like my brain is going to mm -hmm. um, all the ways like invasive species are discussed in uh, in the United States um, and like what gets called an invasive species and what isn't, you know, like uh, the, the hatred towards invasives, like garlic mustard <laughs> in my neighborhood <laughs> or, um, and yet other invasives that were imported from British cows in the 1600s don't get the term invasive, you know, the way that these other invasives do. But I'm trying to think like, I never encountered in Sarawak any language around invasives ever, you know? And um, the Wildlife Center actually housed um, animals that were confiscated. And there was just a few times, there was once uh, uh, some kind of uh, reptile. It was like uh, some kind of gecko that was not uh, from Sarawak. It was not like native to Southeast Asia. And it was probably from Latin America. And then it was held there um, because law enforcement took away the animal from the person and it was um um yes but the language wasn't so much oh that's is an invasive or <laughs> like that's it was more around like i don't i can't even remember if the word was exotic but the idea was that it's from latin america i don't know what we're doing <laughs> i don't know what's gonna happen to it I don't know why it's here, you know, it, you know, like why it's, why it's contained in the space, you know, and not existing as a pet, you know, because obviously it was taken out of its context and can't be sent back. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe it's not in the same way it works, right? Um, thank you so much for such a lively discussion and 
Now I'm turning to Kabiri to conclude this event. So with this last question, we reached the end of today's webinar. Um, we would just like to thank so much to Nermeen and Juno and Jenna for the conversation that we've been able to have here today. We also want to thank Medea Sorma, who has provided off-screen moderation support for all of the events in our series, and also to Caitlin Paolo and our technical organizers and support staff at the Simpson Center of the Humanities. And of course, we thank all of you who've been with us throughout this entire series for your interest and engagement with the series this year. As Kabiri said, this is the final event of the Humanitarianism's Sawyer Seminar. Uh, we hope you have found it as edifying as we have. Um, but this is an enduring project. All of our webinars are published with full indexing and accessibility captioning on YouTube. They are also archived on our project website, humanitarianisms.org. And there you will also find links to pedagogical materials and other publications produced by the participants of this project. So on behalf of everyone, we wanna wish you a good day. Thank you. <laughs>